We have a great honor and a privilege, my wife and myself, uh, to serve Pastor Jackson and Lucy Kengori at Nema Church in Dallas, Texas. Amen. Uh, it's just been a great privilege uh, to serve them. Praise the Lord. I believe with all my heart that God calls a man to a people, one man, a shepherd to his people, a shepherd to a city. And I believe at Nema Church in Dallas, Texas, and in Dallas, it is Pastor Jackson and Lucy Kingori. Amen. And for me and my wife, we have an honor and a privilege to serve them. Amen. He is the one who is called to pastor Nema. I am called to serve him. Amen. I'm, and I'm never confused about that. And I pray for those of you who God has raised in this church to serve under this man. Never get confused about that. He's a man who's called to serve in this city and to serve in this church. Anyone else, no matter how anointed you are, your basic calling is is to serve him. Amen. And if you walk in, in, in alignment, and I'll talk about that, you will begin to reap the blessings of God. That's one thing I've never been confused about. When I was in, 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 uh, in the law area, my calling and, and my commitment was to serve this man and that lady. And, and I did that, I can say faithfully. Amen. Never walk in, in rebellion. Praise the Lord. And, and I just encourage you to make sure that you don't get confused about your calling. No matter how much God uses you, no matter how much he anoints you, never get confused about what your calling is. Amen. And I pray that you'll receive that in Jesus' name. Turn with me to the book of Genesis 1. If you read Genesis 1 from verse 21, the Bible says, So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded according to their kind and every winged bird according to its kind and God saw it was good and God blessed them saying be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters of the earth and let the birds multiply on the earth so the evening and the morning were the fifth day verse 26 then God said let us make man in our image according to our likeness let them have dominion over the fish of, of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and every creeping thing that creeps on earth. So God created man in his image, in the image of God, he created him, male and female created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth and and if you jump to a fast uh, i mean acts 1 verse 1 the bible says the former account i made of theophilus of all the things that jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up after which after he through the holy spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he chose to whom he also presented himself alive after suffering by the many infallible proofs being made being seen um, by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining the kingdom of God. Matthew 3. The Bible says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And I just want to take you through something that I've um, even shared recently in, in, in Dallas over what I believe is the primary role or the primary thing that God has called us. Dr. Miles Monroe once said that where purpose is not known, abuse is inevitable. Where purpose is not known, abuse is inevitable. So one of the fundamental questions we have to ask every one of us is why am I here? Why was God, well, why was I created? Why am I here? Actually, just on a side note, five key questions questions I think everybody should ask. Number one is why am I here? And, and, and that talks of, of purpose. Another question you want to ask is who am I? And that talks of identity. Who am I? Another question everybody should be able to answer is where am I going? And that talks about destiny. Because if you have no idea where you are going, any vehicle is good for you. When you go to the airport, you have to know what your destination. Don't just into, hop into a plane 
and, and, and ask them where they are going and decide you're going there. You have to know where your destiny is. The other question you have to ask yourself is what am I capable of doing? And that talks about potential. What am I capable of doing? And one other question you have to ask uh, yourself is where have I come from? It talks about heritage. Amen. But today I'll just be focusing on, you know, just being able to understand why were we created. When you look at the book of Matthew 3, we see John the Baptist coming and, and, and he talks about repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. If you jump to John 4, 17, the Bible says, from the time Jesus began to preach and say repent for the kingdom of of heaven is at hand. So we are seeing in, in, in Matthew 4 that Jesus starts out to preach and he says that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That, that is his basic message. And then when after his death and resurrection before he, he, he left, the Bible says that he begins or, or, or he concludes by speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom. Many times when, when people die, we, we want to know what were their last words. What, what did they say before they, they die. People want to know, did he say anything? Did he leave his last will and testament? Which is, what, what, was, what was his will? What was his desire? And, and, and we do not have to go far, but to go in Acts and begin to see that Jesus Christ on his exit is talking about the kingdom of God. And in Matthew, as he begins his ministry, he's talking about the kingdom of God. And that speaks volume. If he came in speaking about the kingdom, and if he left speaking about the kingdom, then the kingdom is a priority. There has to be something. Because that is his first words, and those were his last words. Amen. And, 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 and we see the same thing happens with John, that when he comes, he's speaking about the kingdom. And I believe in, with all my heart that at times as a church, and I'm not talking about uh, Christ is yes, I'm talking about the, the body of Christ. We've missed what our fundamental calling and, and, and why God constituted us. We, we, we have forgotten who we really are. We, we, we've come to a place and we think we, we are just a club. But we have to go back to the basics. We have to go back to Genesis and ask God, why did you put us on planet Earth? And the Bible says something very profound. The Bible says that God bless them and, and, and God say to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. I mean, fill the, um, you, you know, the earth. And, and he says, and I'm going to give you dominion. I'm going to create you to have dominion over everything. When he's speaking to himself, and this is the conversation that is happening in Genesis from verse 27. So God created man in his own image and God... Um, in, in the image of God created he, he, male and female created he, them. Then God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion. He's telling us the reason why he created us is for us to have dominion. Amen. For us to have dominion. And unless we are walking in kingdom dominion, we will not fulfill kingdom agenda. We have to walk in kingdom dominion if we are going to fulfill kingdom agenda. There is no way we are going to do God's work our way. Amen. God is releasing an anointing not so much that we can preach great sermons, but so that we can fulfill kingdom agenda. And for me, when I make a commitment in Dallas to serve Pastor King Orris, because I know I'm serving the kingdom agenda. Amen. Whatever it is, that I do. In him I live, in him I move, in him I have my being. And so he tells them, I'm giving you all this. I'm, I'm releasing an anointing. I'm, I'm giving you authority so that you can rule. And it is interesting that he specifies what they were to rule over. He specifies to them and tells them what they were to have dominion over. God's original intent was not for us to have dominions, dominion over our wives. Amen. 
if you actually see the instructions, the Bible says he's giving the instruction. At this point, it appears it is only Adam who is here. But if you read uh, in verse 27, the Bible says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created him. Male and female created them. So it is true, the person he's speaking to right now in this context is Adam. But within Adam, Eve contains... So God is speaking to both of them, but only the person who is getting the instruction is Adam. Now, you will notice it is after the fall that the Bible talks about the man having rulership over the woman, not before the fall. Amen. When you walk out of alignment, you begin to be subjected to stuff you are not supposed to be subjected to. Amen. When you walk in alignment, you begin to walk in the blessings and divine order. Man ruling over woman was a result of woman and man getting out of alignment. Remember even Adam was supposed to have rulership over everything that God had created. But after the fall, even now the devil has power over man. Amen. Why? Because now man is out of alignment. And my challenge for us is to begin to get into alignment with God's purposes for our life. For when we begin to walk in alignment, we begin to walk in dominion. So keys to walking in dominion, number one, understand and embrace God's original intent. The key to understand humankind presence and purpose on earth is to understand God's original intent. If we know what God intended in the beginning, we can make better sense of where we are now and where we need to be going. Intent can be defined as the original purpose. Religion is the result of an inherent hunger in the human spirit that man cannot define yet must seek. Religion at best is humankind's best guess of God's intent. We go through life trying to get God's attention and that is religion instead of spending our time finding God's intent. I'll repeat that again. We spend most of our time trying to beg on God and get God's attention. Whereas God's will and desire is not for us to get his attention. He already has our attention. God's will and desire is for us to discover his intent. His original purpose. The purpose for why you are created. And I'm telling you, you will not compete with people. You will not be bothered by people. When you discover God's intent for your life, you'll begin to walk in divine dominion because you know who you are is to spread his kingdom. Kenya used to be a British colony. And, and, and what happened was that the king or the queen sent some governors to Kenya and they colonized Kenya. And what they began to do was to begin to duplicate whatever was happening in Great Britain in Kenya. So that you find that in Kenya we drive... On what side? And that is what happens over there. For the longest time, we had the same, same constitution. From where? From Britain. Amen. What do we drink in Kenya? Coffee or tea? That is called kingdom influence. The way we dress. Our kind of breakfast. You just need to look at where we came from. Because tea and bread and, and eggs is actually very British. A few years ago, I was in Nigeria, and what they brought me for breakfast was quite interesting. I mean, it was some heavy, heavy dish. But I realized, the shock I had, but I realized that a certain kingdom had had influence on me. Amen. God's will and desire is for his kingdom to influence community and society.
colonization is a negative term for the most part. But the reality is that kingdom agenda is for heaven to colonize earth. And that's why even in the Lord's prayer, he talks about your will be done on earth as it is being done in heaven. All he's saying is we want a duplication of earth. I mean a duplication of heaven here on earth. We want heaven to be duplicated here. We want that kingdom to colonize this kingdom. We want that kingdom to influence this kingdom. Now, because Britain wanted to colonize Kenya, they had to send governors and leaders from the original country to come and influence the new country. They could not trust the guys who are there to try and implement their agenda. Amen. So they had to send people. After some time, they did a thorough job. They could trust you to continue. But not initially. There is no way we can fulfill kingdom agenda and begin to influence earth unless we've come from heaven. Unless we've been schooled in the ways of the kingdom. The reality is, even right now, as they begin to send ambassadors to other countries, they have to take you through some schooling where they begin to educate you about the ways of those people. So there is no way we are going to begin to influence earth unless we are coming from heaven. And that is why the Bible calls us ambassadors of Christ. And he's not sending us into a foreign country just to be part of that country, but to influence the policies of that country. I believe with all my heart that I'm speaking to kingdom diplomats whom God is anointing, who will cause there to be an influence in society. The Bible says that we are the salt of the earth. The salt may not be seen, but it will be felt. Amen. Amen. Making a difference. Kingdom agenda. So unless we embrace God's original intent, we cannot walk in divine dominion. I'm not here to impress you, but to impress on you that God can use you. Amen. That as you surrender, as you begin to embrace him, as you begin to seek his face, as you begin to seek his will, as you begin to have a desire to walk in, in his dominion, that God will begin to transform you and use you to change society. Understanding and embrace God's original intent. Sell on yourself that God wants to use me. Convince yourself. Everything might speak again is that. But you have to come to a place where you speak to yourself. And you sell yourself on the idea that I'm here on kingdom assignment. I make a difference. I matter my presence changes lives. Don't look down upon yourself. The Bible says who has despised the day of small beginnings. Your beginnings might be small, but your latter end shall be glorious. I'm telling you, all we need is, is, is not something huge. But for a people who will get on fire develop a passion for the kingdom i'm telling you today if there's going to be a fire out there you do not need to call people the fire itself will call people amen i don't know about you if you've seen a building that's burning people will just gather themselves to see the building burn you don't have to call people all you need to do is set yourself on fire people will come and watch you burn amen just catch a passion for the kingdom and make the kingdom a priority for you. So we begin to discover kingdom agenda and begin to convince ourselves that this is about the kingdom. Point number two. If you read Genesis 2, 8, the Bible says, The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put man whom he formed. Then God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. And the Lord said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make him 
I have a comparable with him. So God calls Adam and Eve and says, I'm calling you to have dominion over the fish, over the, the, the birds of the air, over the animals. And then he puts them in a garden. Now, the reason why we do not fulfill kingdom agenda is we begin to get caught up in the garden. So kingdom dominion or dominion is above the kingdom, not just the garden. The problem is when you begin to confuse your garden for kingdom influence. Because God tells him, I'm giving you dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air. How many know there is no fish in the garden? There is no bird, bird, birds in the garden. But is it possible that you've become so fixated with your garden, you forget or you forgot that God called you for something greater? It is true you had an assignment to do there, but your calling was beyond there. And that's what I tell people. If it was about us building the Emma, we would just be caught in building a small kingdom in Dallas. But we realize it is beyond that small kingdom. It is beyond our garden in Dallas. It is about kingdom influence. So everything we are doing is strategically positioned to begin to increase our influence because it's not about this small place. Amen. Don't get caught up in just your small kingdom. You do not need to be a multimillionaire to drive a nice small car. Just a couple hundred thousand dollars are enough for you to have a nice small house, to drive a nice small car. But if your prayers for God to increase even financially, it can't be just about your garden. It has to be about kingdom influence. Because for your garden, you do not need a million. For your garden, you might just need about 30,000 for a nice Camry. Maybe 200,000 for a nice house or 300,000 if you're living here. Maybe about another 100,000 to take your kids to school. That's all you need if it is about your small garden. But when you begin to realize that it is about the kingdom, then you realize I need so much more. I need more resources. I need more contacts. I need a bigger influence. Is it that we have limited ourselves to our garden and forgot that before God put Adam in the garden, God had told him, I'm raising you for something great, to have dominion over the fish of the earth, I mean over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air. And I'm here to encourage you. Don't just look at your small garden. Whether it is your job, whether it is your family, whether it is this, begin to increase your faith and say, God, you've called me for so much more. You've called me for kingdom influence. Begin to pray some radical prayers that God give us this city, that God give us this state, that God give us this nation. Amen. Because it's about kingdom influence. The things that God is depositing in the inside of you are so great just for your small garden. God has a greater purpose than what we've settled for. We limit God to our own garden. Dominion is not about a garden. It just starts there. Of course, the other problem is you're trying to change the world, but you're not faithful with your small garden. We start with the garden and we move to the rest of the earth. If you read Matthew 25, when Jesus gives the coins, the two, the three, the one, the two, and the five, and he calls them and he says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in a few. I'll make you ruler. I'll make you ruler. I'll make you have dominion over many things. I read that and I ask myself, it can't have been about investments. It can't have been, when you begin to put big words like, I'll make you ruler over many, it's talking about kingdom dominion. Amen. He's talking about investment here, but when you begin to inject Big words like rulership, like dominion. He's talking about something bigger than one penny or two penny or the five pennies that they got. It must be something bigger than that. But the problem is we get caught up in the one penny, the two penny and the five pennies. And we forget that they were destined and they were being created for dominion and rulership. The assignment that God is giving you is too big for you to handle. I'll say this and I'll move on. 
The Bible says it is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. I thank God that this was a man's, uh, a men's um, meeting. I want to throw a challenge to you. And if there are any young men who are not married here, this especially will be for you. But it is really for everyone. God looks at Adam and he says, you need a wife. So Eve was not Adam's idea. Eve was actually God's idea. Amen. And then he tells Adam, I'm going to give you a helper who's comparable or who's made for you. Now, let me ask, who needs help? Or when do you need help? When is it that you need help? When you're overstretched. When you have a big assignment. So he says, I'm going to give you a helper because I have a big agenda. It is so big that you cannot do it for, I mean, by yourself, I'll give you a helper. So young man, if you're here, you are unqualified to get a wife if you've not discovered your assignment. Because you will just marry her into your confusion. Amen. And for the men who are here, I admonish you. Begin to seek God and ask God, what is my kingdom assignment so that you can get some work for that woman to do? Because if people have nothing to do, they will create a lot of chaos. Amen. Do you have kids and when they have nothing to do, they will do a lot of things. You want to keep them busy. So if you think your wife is disturbing you, discover kingdom agenda and kingdom assignment. Get her something to do. Amen. Amen. So God is calling us to begin to discover what is our assignment. And the assignment we have is so big, you cannot do it by yourself. If you're capable of doing it, then it is not God's assignment. Because God's assignment, you cannot fulfill it by yourself. You cannot fulfill it within your generation. So dominion begins at the garden but does not end there. And the Bible says, this is God speaking to himself and he says, we will create man in our own image. Dominion only comes within the context of duplication. And therefore, transformation is necessary. And I'll explain that. He's saying, I'm going to create man in my image and in my likeness. And he says, man, then go ahead and have dominion. There is no man who is going to fulfill God's assignment without God's image. The problem is we are trying to walk in dominion and fulfill God's agenda and God's assignment without having the image of God on us. You cannot do God's work your way. And that's why we need to seek God's face. That's why we need to walk in communion with God so that we are transformed and so we are lifted from one level of glory to another. I cannot fulfill kingdom agenda unless I've duplicated and I look like him. And that's why he says we are going to create man in our image. The assignment is so big he cannot do it unless he has our image on him. The disciples are sent to ask Jesus whether it is okay to pay taxes. And he gets a piece of coin and he asks them whose image is on this coin. And they say Caesar. And he tells them give to Caesar what is Caesar and to God what is God. Now what they should have asked because they knew that the image on the coin was Caesar's and they were told, give to Caesar what was Caesar's. The thing they forgot to ask is, whose image is on God? I mean, God on. Because he tells them, give to Caesar what is Caesar, and the coin has the image of Caesar. So if I were them, I would be asking, on whose image is God? And I'm here to tell you that the image of God is on you. That is why you are called for dominion, because the image of God is on you. As we drive and as we go through planet, we are busy impressing us, you know, one another with different labels. I drive a Benz, I drive this. You know, they're always having a certain image. Nokia has an image, Samsung has an image. But I thank God that on you is stamped the image of Christ. Amen. As I walk on planet Earth, I'm walking in dominion knowing that I have the image of Christ on me. Just like some certain images or brands turn necks 
a Benz will, the, the other day I was driving and I saw, um, I, I think, it, was it a Maserati or one of those big cars? And man, I'm, I'm just almost driving off the road just admiring it. And, and I was very mad because that guy was not looking at my car. <laughs> but I'm here to tell you that when you begin to have the image of God manifest in you, People, you will not need to call people. That guy did not keep putting and say, look at me, look at me. All he needed to do is have a certain image, a certain label. Amen. And that is the thing. When you begin to walk in dominion, when you begin to walk in communion with God, in fellowship with God, his image on you will just begin to attract people. You do not have to struggle with people. You do not have to call people. But the image of God in you will be the difference maker. So duplication has to precede dominion. You cannot do God's work if you don't look like him. You cannot do his things your way. Something has to happen on the inside of us. There has to be a transformation for us to begin to fulfill kingdom agenda. The Bible says that in Genesis 3 we see that God has called them to give them dominion. But the enemy comes and he says, has God said? And, and Eve listens to the enemy. Many times we blame Eve for listening to Satan. Do you realize that Eve actually begins to have a conversation with, with the devil? Says, no, God, God said this tree, uh, we cannot eat this one, we can eat. At least they're having a conversation, they are, they're having an argument. But the devil convinces Eve and Eve takes the fruit. And the Bible says that Adam is right there, he's given the fruit and he eats. At least the woman argued. Adam just takes it and swallows it. And many times we think that Adam was at a distance, but he was right there because the Bible says Eve gave Adam and he ate. Never asked a question. And the question I have here is this. Why did Adam allow the devil to speak to his woman? Men, God has called us as protectors. The people you should not allow to talk to your woman. Be that jealous husband who, who protects their wife. If the enemy is attacking your wife, it is your responsibility to stand there as a man and say, I will not keep quiet when my family is going down. It is sad that most of our prayer meetings are filled with women. Man, God is calling us to stand up and begin to intercede on behalf of our families and say, devil, you're not taking my family. You will not talk to my wife. You will not talk to my children. I'm going to stand on the man of this house and fight against you. God is calling us to arise as men that we can stand for our families and say, devil, you will not talk into my family. And we see that the enemy speaks to them and they lose their power and their dominion. They actually get thrown out of the garden. Dominion demands dialogue. But the question is who are you speaking to? Or who is speaking into your life? You cannot walk in dominion if it is not the word of God that is speaking into your life. And that's my challenge. Who is speaking into your life? Who have you allowed to speak into your life? Who is it that you're listening to? There are so many dissenting voices even in a city like this. But I pray that you will choose to listen to God's word. I pray that you will choose to listen to, to the man of God that God has set over you to walk in, 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 uh, you know, in submission to them. I do not listen to everybody. If I get an invitation, I'll always have to check with my pastor. Next week I was supposed to speak in a church in Arlington, Texas. I said, hey pastor, um, uh, this invitation. And he said, this might not be the right time uh, just because of scheduling. And I called that pastor and said, I'd love to come. But we'll have to push it to me. Why? Because I walk in some mission and Pastor Kingori's voice in my life means something. So who is it that is speaking to you? You cannot walk in dominion hear a different voice. Dominion demands dialogue. I pray that you're spending time in prayer, time seeking God's face. And because of time, I'll just close with this one. And I started with this in Genesis 3. When Eve ends up sinning and Adam ends up sinning. And they're told that cast is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat 
of all uh, you shall eat of it all the days of your life dominion succeed only in alignment i don't care how anointed you are if you walk out of alignment you'll never experience god's blessings the bible says that where brethren dwell in unity god commands a blessing their blessings that you get from giving there are blessings you get from prayer. But there's a blessing you only get from unity. The Bible says we have brethren dwell together in unity. There God commands a blessing. There are some you can tap in other ways. But there's a blessing you will never access until you walk in unity. You can pray, you can fast, you can bind the devil. That one is only activated by unity. When you walk in alignment. Fasting will not get it. Prayer will not get it. Giving will not get it. Tithing will not get that particular blessing. There are others it will get. But there is a blessing that only comes when you walk in alignment. And these guys decide to walk out of alignment. They decide that they were better listening you know, to the enemy than to God. And it is sad. The lie they believed in. The enemy tells them if you eat this fruit, you will be like God. That God is trying to keep you from being like him. The Bible says that he created them in his image. The devil is trying to tell you to sin so that you can be like something you already are. In the New Testament, the devil picks up Jesus, takes him to the mountain, shows him the kingdom and he tells him, if you bow before me, I will give you the kingdom. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Why is the devil trying to give Jesus the kingdom? Even the person trying to give the kingdom belongs to him. Was created by him. Thank God Jesus did not fall for that nonsense. But in Genesis, the Adam and Eve are told you'll be like God. They were like God. They were created in God's image. We are walking in sin trying to pursue stuff that God has already given to us. He's given us dominion. He's given us favor. He's given us open doors and opportunities. We do not have to compromise and walk in sin to access what is already ours by faith. If we realize that God has given us dominion, all we need to enter is, is in dominion and we begin to access. But the enemy is making us sin to get stuff that is already ours by birth. But when we realize that we serve, a great king walking in dominion is easy. Dr. Lockridge said this and I'll read this and turn over the mic. Just to give you a glimpse of the kind of king we serve. My king was born king. The Bible says my king is a king in seven ways. He's a king of the Jews, the racial king, the king of Israel, a national king, the king of righteousness, He's a king of ages. He's a king of heaven. He's a king of glory. He's a king of kings and the Lord of lords. Now that's my king. Well, I wonder, do you know him? Do you know him? Don't try to mislead me. Do you know my king? David says, the heavens declare the glory of the Lord and the firmament showeth his handiwork. My king is the only on whom there is no means or measure that can define his limitless love. No fasting telescope can bring into visibility the coastline of his shoreless supplies. No barriers can hinder him from pouring out his blessings. Well, he's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally grateful. He's impartially powerful. He's in, impartially merciful. That's my king. He is God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's a centerpiece of civilization. He stands alone in, in, in himself. He's august and he's unique. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He's supreme. He's preeminent. He's the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest person in, in philosophy. He's the supreme problem in higher criticism. He's the fundamental doctrine in true theology. He's the core and necessity of spiritual religion. That's my king. He's a miracle of the age. He's the superlative of everything good that you choose to call him. Well, he's the only one able to supply all our needs simultaneously. He supplies strength to the weak. He is available to the tempted and the tried. 
He sympathizes and he saves. He is our God and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleanses the leper. He forgives the sinner. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the aged. He rewards the diligent and beautifies the meek. Do you know him? Well, my king is the key to knowledge, the wellspring of wisdom, the doorway of deliverance, the path of peace, the roadway of righteousness, the highway of holiness, the gateway of glory, the master of the mighty. He's the captain of the conquerors. He's the head of the heroes. He's the leader of the legislatures. He's the overseer of overseers. He's the governor of governors. He's the prince of peace. He's the king of kings and the lord of lords. That's my king. Yeah, his office is, in, is manifold. His promise is sure. His life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. He reigns in righteousness. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. That's my king. He's indescribable. He's indispensable. He's incomprehensible. He's invisible. He's irresistible. You cannot get him out of your mind. You cannot get him out of your head. You cannot live without him. You cannot outlive him. The Pharisees couldn't stand him. Amen. The Pharisees couldn't stand him. But they found they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault of, on, on him. The witness couldn't get their testimonies to agree. Herod couldn't kill him. Death could not handle him. And the grave could not hold him. He's always been and always will be. I'm talking about he has no predecessor, he has no successor. There is nobody before him and there will be nobody after him. You cannot impeach him because you did not elect him. Amen. Thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. We serve a mighty king and my praise that God would cause you to begin to walk in divine dominion because that's the kind of king we serve. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.